two, one. All right. As promised, we're uh, we're getting our uniforms on, so let's um, get to it. All right. All right. So recall that we call a function continuous if it's continuous at each point in uh, in the real in its domain. Excuse me. What? All right. We're not even. It's not even a minute, man. Come on. All right. Anyway. All right. So function is uh, continuous uh, if it's continuous at each point in its uh, domain. Right, so note, that means that given an epsilon, then for each c, because we're continuous at c, we can find a delta greater than zero. Let's include that. <coughs> oh, excuse me. I did good in the other video. I don't think I coughed at all. Maybe I did. I'm on an inhaler now, by the way, so... <laughs> oh, boy. Um, so, yeah, the future videos will be less <laughs> awful. We'll see. Alright, anyway, uh, so given an epsilon, then for each c, we can find a delta so that continuity happens. The, the difference between f of x and f of c is less than epsilon for all x in the domain, so that uh, the distance from x to c is less than delta. So, outputs are close whenever inputs are close, hence the idea of continuity. Alright, uh, but note something. Note something about this logical uh, statement here. For all epsilon, then for each s, there is a delta. By the time we get to the delta, we have gone through a for all epsilon and a for all c. So, that means the delta that is being guaranteed to exist is dependent upon both the epsilon and the c. Right, so given an epsilon and given an s x and e uh, a c and s, then there is a positive delta so that the continuity goes down. So our goals are as follows. So the first thing we're going to do is strictly explain what it means for delta to be dependent on both the epsilon and the c. Okay. <clears throat> And so to do that, we will set up the idea of uniform continuity, which is going to be, given an epsilon, there is a delta, and that delta is not dependent on any points in the domain. So, equip with that, we'll see that uniform continuous functions must be continuous, but we will then find continuous functions that fail to be uniform. So, in other words, uh, given an epsilon, the delta that is found is dependent on uh, the inputs. All right, so, and then after we have done that, we will then focus on producing conditions that ensure that the delta depends solely upon the epsilon. So, right, again, the notion of continuity is, right, a function is continuous on a domain, but the way this was set up was that we're continuous for each point. So each point has a condition that needs to be satisfied. We would be a lot happier if there was a notion of continuity that the epsilon directly influenced the delta without any input from the any particular points in the domain. That is the idea behind uniform continuity, and as we're going to see, most of the functions we will ever consider will end up actually being uniformly continuous. Uh, however, there are some reasonable functions that fail to have this property. So, that is the goal for today, um, and so for right now, this might feel a little esoteric, a little pedantic, um, because it is, uh, but this is going to have serious implications when we get to integration. Um, so this is, uh, this is starting the fires, this is where I've got, I've got fingers in many soups. Um, so we're, we're, we're planting seeds for later on, um. Anyway, all right, so let's now, uh, now that we've kind of out, uh, planned the work, let's work the plan. Okay, so what does it mean to be uniformly continuous? Well, precisely what we want. Given an epsilon, there is a delta, so that continuity occurs. And note, given an epsilon, there is a delta, and the delta does not care about the inputs, right? Uh, the delta just exists, and it's only dependent on the epsilon, okay. and that's it. So note, it's just a uh, minor rearrangement of the logical quantifiers. Before a function is continuous, if for all epsilon and for all points, 
then there is a delta, so that stuff happens. Here we have, for all epsilon, there is a delta, so that for all points, continuity happens. Input is close when, uh, output is close when input is close. So it's a very subtle difference, a very minor point, right? But as we're going to see, there are continuous functions that fail to do this, and in a sense, they're kind of not good. Anyway, so let's first of all prove something. If we're uniformly continuous, then we must be continuous. All right. So what does it mean to be continuous? That means for each point, our function is continuous at the point. All right, so again, remember, continuity was defined at a point. A function being continuous means that every point is behaving. Uniform continuity here is circumventing any dependence on points and just a broad property that our function would possess. So if we want to show that uniform continuity implies continuity, we need to verify that for any point C living in S, there is a delta that works. Well, our hypothesis says there is a delta that works uh, for all X and Y in capital S. Let me fix that. Okay, well, then any X and S that is within delta of C, F of X minus F of C must be less than epsilon. So there we go, we are continuous at C, and since C was arbitrary, that means we're continuous at every point in the domain, and thus we are continuous. Okay, so at first glance, this proof doesn't seem like anything really happened, because nothing really did, right? Because again, this notion of uniform continuity is, I want continuity, but I want it to be really good. Right? I don't want it to be dependent upon any particular point in the domain. Right? I want to be continuous uniformly across the domain. Okay. okay. So, right, so the proof then, if that's what we're trying to capture, the proof here should be boring. It should just be the definition was chosen accordingly so that things worked. And they did. Okay. But again, note the subtle difference between the two uh, concepts, right? Continuous means you're continuous at each point. Uniformly continuous means we've got this property here, which grabs the continuity at every point. All right, well, now that we know that everything that's uniformly continuous is continuous, we should probably give examples revealing that the converse is not necessarily true. Okay, and so we'll start with an example that probably shouldn't be too shocking, um, uh, 1 over x, of course, is a continuous function. However, um, this particular uh, function is not uniformly continuous. Uh, note the domain. Okay. okay. So, we know that f is continuous, right? That's just, we know this, this is true. 1 over does not screw up limits, so 1 over x is continuous. Okay. Now, suppose it was uniformly continuous. As we're going to see, it's not going to happen. And before going into this, we can kind of suspect that this would fail to be uniformly continuous, because 1 over x, as you get close to 0, we know this goes off to infinity. Right? So this function bends really far up, and quite quickly, if you think about it. Right? Because at 1, it's 1. Uh, right, and at one tenth it's ten, at one one hundred if it's a hundred, at one one billion if it's a billion. So, right, as you get closer to zero, it really shoots up to infinity pretty quickly. Okay. So, given an epsilon, to ensure that the outputs are with an epsilon, the delta, right, there's no way that we can have a delta that works for every possible input because. There are very close inputs, like 1 over a billion and 1 over uh, 1 quadrillion, or, or something like that, um, where those numbers are very close, but the outputs are massively apart from each other. Right, so the continuity is there, but it's highly dependent upon the elements of the domain. Okay. All right, so let's actually demonstrate that it can't be uniformly continuous. If it was, then we could find a delta so that f of x minus f of y gets less than 1 for all x and y living in... Um, I don't know why that's open right there. Let me just fix that. Man, a lot of little minor typos in this one. Sorry about that. All right. Okay, so obviously, what, what are we going to do? We're going to prove 1 is strictly less than 1, but how are we going to pull that off? Right. Well, 
uh, our uh, sequence, one over n, note, lives in our domain. That sequence we know is convergent, and thus it is Cauchy. So there is some point n so that the terms get within delta of each other. Okay. All right, so note uniform continuity. For any positive, there is a delta. We're picking the specific positive number 1. All right, but now what's going to happen? Well, uh, 1 over n and 1 over n plus 1 live in 0, 1. And note that uh, n and n plus 1 are bigger than n, so the difference between these two things is delta. The uniform continuity now for all x and y. I'm, that's missing. I just realized. Oh, man, this is a uh, yeesh. So yikes for me, dog. Okay. Right, for all x and y with that. <laughs> uh, obviously. Okay. All right, so, yeah. Okay. We know it's continuous because 1 over um, does not square up limits. All right, if it was uniformly continuous, then um, since 1 is a positive number, I could find a delta so that I can get the outputs within 1 for all x and y <coughs> that are within delta of each other. The sequence we know is Cauchy, so we know we can get these things less than delta at some point. Note that 1 over n plus 1 and 1 over n live in our, in our domain. They are within delta of each other. Uh, however, what then happens? Well, since these inputs are within delta of each other, we know that the outputs must be within 1. But what is my function? My function is 1 over... So if you 1 over this, we get n plus 1. If you 1 over that, we get n. And what do you know, our favorite contradiction, 1 strictly less than 1. And there we go. 1 over x is not uniformly continuous. But it is continuous. All right. All right, and so this example, um, like I said, uh, going into this, not too shocking. If we think about what 1 over x looks like, and again, just think of the notion of uniform continuity, that inputs, uh, that outputs are close whenever inputs are close, and the inputs, right, there is one delta that works for all of them. Right, but, right, going into it, I kind of, right, ex explicitly noted, right, 1 over a billion, and 1 over a billion and 1... Right, are incredibly close to each other, but their outputs are one away from each other. Right. So there is no hope of getting uh, the outputs arbitrarily small for inputs that are arbitrarily close. Makes sense. Okay, so this seems like a pretty reasonable thing to expect and kinda and right, and maybe and one over something, while that is nice and continuous, we can expect it to not be perfectly well behaved, right? It it blows up to infinity. Yeah, okay, sure. Uh, what if I told you, what if I told you that our good friend x squared is going to betray us? x squared is betraying us. x squared is continuous, but it fails to be uniformly continuous. Right? This should, this, at first glance, this should make you mad. This should just make you, oh wait, hold on. No, 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 no. x squared's a nice function. E e even though, as we go off to positive infinity or negative infinity, it gets arbitrarily large, it's x squared, right? It's growing at a rate of 2 times x. That's fine. But think about it. Think about it. I want my inputs to be close. Now, as you go further and further out, x squared does turn upwards. Right? So, the outputs being close, I don't think there could possibly be a delta that works all the time. Right? The delta is going to have to depend on the points. Because as you go further and further out to positive or negative infinity, right, 100 squared versus 101 squared, say. 100 and 101 are only one away from each other. But you square those two, it, it starts, the gaps start getting a lot bigger and bigger. But let's actually prove it. Okay, so first of all, we know this is continuous. It's a polynomial. We already know those are continuous, so nothing to do, nothing to see here. All right, but let's suppose it was uniformly. 
Okay, well that would mean that there is a delta, so that x squared minus y squared is less than 1, and that's good for any x and y that are within delta of each other. So at first glance, this seems like it should be fine, um, but, uh, but something, something happens here. Let's pick x to be 1 over delta plus delta over 4, and y to be 1 over delta minus delta over 4. Uh, note that when I add them together, I get 2 delta. And when I take their difference, I get delta over 2 dot pause. Okay. <laughs> Yo, these, these, these slides are jank. Man. Spoiled everything right there. Okay. All right, so note uh, that the sum is 2 over delta, and the difference is delta over 2. All right, so we know their difference gets less than delta. Note what their product is going to equal. Their product's going to equal 1, isn't it? Oh, yeah. That's true. Well, what's their product equal to? Oof. I'm a goof. One strictly less than one. Uh, so this is exactly how I did it, uh, by the way. Um, uh, uh, I uh, started with x squared minus y squared. I factored it out. And I went, all right. Uh, if we were uniform, uh, uniformly continuous, then I can make this less than 1. And then so I was like, alright, how do I make this product equal 1? And then I just basically did something like this. Um, uh, they're um, trying to make it work with 1 over delta and just delta. Uh, I think you can, I, I think you might be able to do it. Uh, well, no, I don't think so. I think you're going to have to... Well, I think if you 1 over 2 delta and 1 over 2 delta and then delta over 2 and delta minus 2, does that work? Yeah, I think that works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway. I went with this, so... Yeah, that should work. So sum gives you uh, delta, they cancel, and when you take the difference, you pick up delta. Ah, right, yeah, yeah. Ah, right, yeah, if you just wanted it to be... Nice and clean, I guess. I felt like having the twos <laughs> there. Uh, anyway, there you go. But yeah. Well, there we go. X squared betrays us. It fails to be uniformly continuous. And note, it actually fails uh, not necessarily in the way that I was speaking of. There's kind of a symmetry here that I'm using, that I'm exploiting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. All right, cool. All right, well, so now we have two examples of continuous functions that fail to have the uniform continuity property. One of them, maybe not the most unexpected thing. One of them, maybe a little unexpected. Yeah, X squared feels like it should be behaving. But it turns out that X squared doesn't always misbehave. So, something that has hopefully started to formulate in your brain, something that you may have noticed, is that uniform continuity seems like it's domain-dependent. And as we see here, that is absolutely the case. The function x squared is continuous, and depending on the domain you restrict your attention to, it may or may not be uniformly continuous. So here, if we restrict our attention to just good old 0, 1, then what we've got is a uniformly continuous function. All right, and it's super easy to see. Let epsilon be greater than 0, pick any x and y that live in 0, 1, and let x and y have a distance less than epsilon over 2. Note, my delta in this case depends solely on epsilon. All right, well, then if we look at f of x minus f of y, I've got x squared minus uh, y squared. We know that factor is as follows. Triangle inequality tells me this holds. Now, what do we know about x and y? They're not negative, and they're no bigger than 1 each, so we pick up a factor of 2. Good thing I've got this less than epsilon over 2, so I get the whole thing less than epsilon, and there we go. Ah, uh, ha, ha. Beautiful. So, here we see that uniform continuity is something that not necessarily the formula of the function is going to dictate, but rather the domain of the function. 
You can have a function that is continuous and fails to be uniformly continuous, but if you restrict its domain, then you'll actually get the uniform continuity. So that means that if we are looking for conditions to ensure a continuous function is uniformly so, we should probably focus our attention on nice domains. Now, 0, 1, as we see here in the proof, what did we use? We used the fact that it was bounded, right? So, clearly we had the bound of 1, but, right, you can replace 1 with any number here and then change uh, our delta accordingly. So, bounded seems like something we would need, and if we let our minds float back to the extreme value theorem, not only did we include bounded, we also inclu include included the closed property, the fact that limits don't escape the set. Now, here in this proof, we don't particularly see that showing up anywhere. Um, however, note, we've got f of x minus f of y is less than a factor of x minus y. Hmm. I wonder if that's a thing we're going to see in a moment. So, uh, it turns out that if the domain is closed and bounded, then any continuous function must be uniformly so. And there we go. Beautiful. All right, so again, uh, level proves this for uh, k equaling the closed interval a to b. Uh, but as we noted, really, as you'll see in the proof, what we really need is the domain to be bounded because we're going to make a sequence and a bounded a sequence living in a bounded set gives us a convergent subsequence, and then we just need the closure property so that the limit of that convergent subsequence remains in our set. All right. Um, and historically speaking, um, this is actually what was originally proven. Um, so while level sticks to the simpler case of k is equal to a to b, um, it was actually proven for a closed and bounded set. It was this uh, statement right here was actually originally proven uh, by a guy named Heine, H-E-I-N-E. -E. Um, and he used the closure and the boundedness. He actually used um, kind of an interesting version of it, though. So we're going to do a proof. Um, that's very similar to the proofs that we've been doing where we're creating sequences and then passing the convergent subsequences, which is a very common analysis technique. Um, but Burrell actually used closed and bounded in a very... Uh, Burrell. Uh, Heine. Burrell shows up in the story in a moment here. Heine actually used it um, uh, because in, in a different way. Uh, closed and bounded actually implies that every uh, what's called an open cover has a finite subcover. So, since you're continuous, at each point C, there is a delta. All of the deltas give you what's called an open cover, and then you get away with finitely many, then you have finitely many deltas, and then you just take the minimum, and there you go. Um, so, that was uh, Heine's proof of this, which we're not going to do, but historically speaking, um, that ended up being the catalyst for uh, defining... Uh, the notion of what's called a compact set, which uh, I briefly spoke of uh, last video, um, which again is a topological concept, which in the real line is equivalent to closed and bounded. Um, but um, Heine, in his uh, task to prove this, demonstrated that this open cover maneuver uh, was quite powerful. Uh, then other mathematicians... Um, saw that and applied that idea elsewhere, Burrell being one of them, um, and then uh, the modern formulation of compact is due to uh, something named uh, Henry LeBeg. Um, and if you've heard of LeBeg before, um, he's the guy who made integration even worse than it already is. So, um, anyway. All right. Let's uh, do the proof now. That's the brief little uh, history of this particular theorem. So, uh, yeah, check it out. So again, uh, this is, um, mid 1800s. Yeah. Somewhere around there. What's, what's, when, when's Heine active? I think like 1840s or something. I'm trying to think exact dates on it. Um, LeBeg is actually a little bit more, uh, recent. He's like 1910s is, is when LeBeg is doing his work. 
Um, so, you know, not even 100 years ago. Anyway. All right, cool. All right, so uh, let's do the proof. So how is the proof going to work here? Well, we're going to do it by contradiction. We're going to suppose that if you're not uniformly continuous, we're going to cause a problem. Okay. Now, what would that mean? That would mean that there's a bad epsilon. What does it mean for there to be a bad epsilon in this case? This means that there is an epsilon, so that for any positive delta, we can find x and y in the domain that are within delta, but their outputs are bigger than epsilon. All right. So, as I've already spoiled, we're going to pass to a sequence. So, for each n, that means we can find an x sub n and a y sub n, so that x sub n and y sub n are within 1 over n, but their outputs are always greater than epsilon. Okay, so the sequence x sub n lives in k, k is bounded, so that means there is a convergent subsequence. Let x be its limit, and note that x must be in the domain here, because it is closed, so limits do not escape the set. Alright, so what we're going to prove now is that not only does the subsequence x sub n sub k converge to x, so does y sub n sub k. That shouldn't be too shocking, because they're arbitrarily close to each other. Right? Indeed. Uh, if you look at y sub n sub k minus x, you can sneak in a x sub n sub k. All right, this uh, we know is chosen so that 1 over n sub k is less than it. All right, now this term right here, since the limit of x sub n sub k is x, this we know we can get less than epsilon over 2. And 1 over n converges to 0, so the subsequence 1 over n k must also converge to zero. So that means we can make this less than epsilon over two. So that means this can be made less than epsilon. In other words, the limit of this is indeed x. Now, if you wanted to more formally write that out with given an epsilon, you could find a capital N. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could work out the details, being a little lazy, but that's okay. It's fine. This inequality implies this. You can fill in the deeds if you're so inclined. Okay, so now we have a sequence that converges to x, and another sequence that converges to x. Uh, but yeah, that, that's, uh, that ain't it, chief. f is continuous, so that means the limit of this must equal f of x, and the limit of this is also equal to f of x. So, that means that at some point, I can get these uh, within epsilon over 2 of each other. But, these have to be epsilon apart. And then by the triangle inequality, and I'm missing a parenthesis. Fix that. By the triangle inequality, this is less than epsilon over 2, and so is this. So, epsilon is strictly less than epsilon, our favorite uh, contradiction. I told you. I told you when we were talking about inequalities that you're going to be shocked at how often we were going to do x is strictly less than x. Oof. Yeah. Okay, beautiful. All right, so there we go. Contradiction has occurred. So if you are continuous on a closed and bounded set, you must be uniformly so. Okay, there we go. And that's kind of the big theorem. So note, that reveals that for the most part, most continuous functions we're going to con consider are going to be uniformly continuous, right? Because especially when we get on to integration, where all of that will take place on an interval from A to B, closed interval from A to B, and we know those are closed and bounded, so we know we have uniform continuity for any continuous functions we consider. So this is good news, right? And like I said, when we get to integration, this is going to be the key ingredient in proving that every continuous function is in fact integrable. Good stuff. All right, so what else we got to talk about? As you can see, I got, I got 10 more slides. I got you for 10 more slides, bruh. All right, so what are we going to talk about now? Now, we're going to talk about um, a special type of function, a, special, a function that's got a very near and dear place to my heart. Um, my uh, second uh, published article that I ever wrote was about Lipschitz functions, which we will now speak of. All right, so uh, uh, named after a mathematician, uh, yeah, Otto Lipschitz? Oh god, what the hell is his first name? Is it Otto? 
I don't know. The doctor from Rugrats. That's yeah. I maybe that's maybe that's too much of a reference. I, there's like new Rugrats. I haven't watched it. There's like new Rugrats, and I, I think I was like surprised because the voice of the guy who voices Stu died, and they got um that one guy from Veep is voicing Stu now. I, I, I think. Um. Anyway. So speaking of Lipschitz, in the original Rugrats, Dr. Lipschitz is voiced by Tony J, um, who also voices uh, Megabyte from the show Reboot. Uh, Tony J has been dead for like 20 years. Um, uh, he also voices Frollo in uh, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, uh, an all-time great Disney movie. I'm losing to a bird. Uh, great, I, I felt that when George Costanza said that. Uh... <laughs> Uh, Tony J is also the voice of Spideris from, um, that spider show with... You've seen, yeah, yeah, you have seen that spider. You may not know what it's from, but that's, uh, Google Spideris. This is very important material, by the way. This is gonna be on your homework. And, um, speaking of reboot, there was a redo of it recently, and... Um, they got somebody else to do Megabyte's voice, and he does, like, a spot-on impersonation of Tony J. It's amazing. Speaking of which, uh, last thing, and then, then I'll get to the actual mathematics. Uh, Google, find the scene from Reboot, uh, it was, like, season three, I think, um, where an adult Enzo, um, faces Megabyte. That is, that is, that is, that is real shit, let me tell you. 11 year old me or however old I was I was, I was that was that was hype let me tell you okay anyway all right so uh, Lipschitz is a mathematician and he came up with studying these functions here and uh, you may notice hey we kind of proved x squared is uh, Lipschitz on zero one and note that we just verified that x squared is uniformly continuous on zero one oh Every Lipschitz function is uniformly continuous. So, as I noted, um, there's going to be a lot of cases where, for the most part, the functions we will consider are uniformly continuous. And as we're about to see, a lot of the functions that we actually care about, they're actually Lipschitz. Now, there are some obvious exceptions to this, as we will see. Um, so, for example, not to spoil anything, but square root of x fails to be Lipschitz. Um, but, a lot of functions are, and Lipschitz functions are super interesting, there's a lot of, like, uh, pretty neat theory, uh, there's a really cool book, uh, called Lipschitz Algebras by Nick Weaver, um, which is super high level, it, it's absolutely not accessible, um, N Nick Weaver is also, like, a grade-A lunatic, um, <laughs> Uh, but it's a super fascinating book, and he makes a really great argument as to why, um, Lipschitz functions should really take center stage in, in, um, uh, not, uh, really in analysis, yeah, he kind of makes the argument that Lipschitz functions are incredibly important, um, and they shouldn't just be kind of like that random thing you talked about in analysis for, like, a day, which is what we're gonna do with him, but, uh, anyway, so, uh, re read the preface, I guess, of that book, uh, I think the PDF's freely available online. Um, and, and he, he does a very good job of explaining why Lipschitz functions are so, um, uh, foundational to the study of mathematics, because they, in some sense, encode the notion of distance. Um, anyway. Alright. Alright, but let's prove that every Lipschitz function is uniformly continuous, um, and now let's note that it's gonna be pretty easy. Let epsilon be greater than zero. By hypothesis, there is a non-negative, a, uh, a, uh, strictly positive L, so that this holds. Okay. Well, for any X and Y that are, uh, within epsilon over L of each other, Lipschitzness guarantees this, and this is guaranteed by that. And there we go. Every Lipschitz function is uniformly continuous. Beautiful. So, if you want to verify a function is uniformly continuous, a good way to check it is, see if it's Lipschitz. Right, and as we will now prove in a massive proposition with seven parts, um, 
there are a lot of functions that you know and love that are Lipschitz. So, first off, the identity function is Lipschitz. Constant functions are Lipschitz. Scaling a Lipschitz function keeps it Lipschitz. The sum of the two Lipschitz functions is Lipschitz. The product is Lipschitz as long as my functions are bounded. X to the n is Lipschitz as long as the domain is bounded. And every polynomial is Lipschitz as long as the domain is bounded. And that shouldn't be too surprising as we've already seen x squared can betray us if the domain is not bounded. No, you don't need close. You just need bounded. Close would just be uh, gravy. All right. Cool. Okay, so this proposition has a lot of parts to it, but I mean, for the most part, none of these are too difficult to prove. Uh, the only proof that's going to be somewhat interesting will be five. Um, one, two, three, four is just going to be purely unraveling the definition. Five, there's going to be one little trick with the bounded. Um, and then six and seven are just going to follow from all the other points. So let's, um, let's get to it. Okay. Well, for the identity function, pick L to be positive one. Done. For a constant function, pick L to be one. Done. All right, if I scale my function, if I scale it by zero, it's constant, so point two tells me it's Lipschitz. If it's non-zero, well, then, um, since my function is Lipschitz, I know there is a capital L positive, so that this holds. Absolute value of alpha is positive, so when I print the uh, product of two, I'm positive, and if I now look at alpha x, alpha of f of x, and alpha f of y, I can pull out the alpha. This I know can be made less than L times X minus Y. And there we go. Alpha F must be Lipschitz. Okay. Uh, so side note, um, uh, speaking of Lipschitz, um, the condition requires that there is an L. You can actually find a smallest L, if you could believe it. There is a smallest Note, I said smallest. There is a minimum. Not an infimum. There is a straight-up minimum. Which is really cool. Um, it's called the Lipschitz constant. And it um, takes a little bit of work uh, to, first of all, verify that it has to exist. And then, um, second of all, actually, like, do anything with it. Um, that's why we're not going to talk about it. But if you're interested in Lipschitz functions, check it out. Getting another olive attack right now. What's up, kitty? Alright. Okay, so now point four, the sum of two Lipschitz functions is Lipschitz. This shouldn't be too uh, shocking because L plus P seems like that should work. And indeed. Call up your friend Todd Howard because it just works. And yeah. There you go. Some of any two Lipschitz functions remains Lipschitz, right? Look at this. We can rearrange it so we got f of x minus f of y, g of x minus g of y. This we know we can make less than that. This can be made less than that. And so there is the constant, L plus p. Right, Ali? Okay, so... Like I said, just purely unraveling the definition. Nothing too exciting here. Product is where it's going to get spicy. Okay, so note it. The assumption was that my functions are Lipschitz, so I have this. But I also have that they're bounded. So, um, as we talked about with bounded functions, uh, it could be any real number, but for most purposes you want it to be strictly positive. It can also be a, a natural number as well, if you so desire. But here we'll just have the bounds be positive A and B. Alright. So, what are we going to do? Well, uh, B times L is positive. A times P is positive. So, BLAP is positive. Now, we'll look at f of g times x, uh, f of g of x, f times g of x, God, that's what I wanted to say, and f times g of y. Note that this is f of x times g of x, 
and f of y times g of y. Now, uh, we saw this when we did the product of two continuous functions as continuous. You sneak this in, and then you pull it apart as follows. Now, for continuous functions, we know that they're uh, we know that we were able to uh, get these things to be small um, by choosing things accordingly. But here with the Lipschitz, you got to throw in the, the boundedness in the hypothesis. With a continuous, you can cheat a little bit right here at this stage, but for us, we have to um, be a little bit more careful. Okay, so this is less than B, this is less than L times X minus Y. That's less than A, this is less than P times X minus Y, and then you factor it out, blap, goes to the Lipschitz function. Okay. Beautiful. Okay. So, uh, like I noted, uh, this little trick is used whenever you're dealing with absolute values of products. Um, so, coming in here, you need, you need some, you're right, you, you need to be able to put bounds on these. And, uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, so remember with, um, with sequences, which is how we did it, there's, there was a way of circumventing, uh, dealing with this, because these were specific elements. Uh, every convergent sequence is bounded, so you got a bound on one of them, and one of these we got rid of using the, um, the fact that this got less than epsilon. <clears throat> All right, but there we go. Um, so like I said, uh, 0.5 here was really the only one that was somewhat tricky uh, of a proof. Again, not horribly tricky, but it, it had a, uh, there were some steps. All right, so now, uh, as noted, 6 and 7 are basically for free. So 6 is revealing that x to the n is Lipschitz on a bounded domain. So since s is bounded, that means there is an m. Uh, greater than zero, so that x is less than or equal to m. That implies that this function right here is bounded. Point 0.1 ensures that g is Lipschitz, and point 0.5 says that the product of any bounded, uh, any, uh, bounded Lipschitz functions remains Lipschitz. So, multiply g by itself enough times until we get to f, and that will keep the Lipschitz going. There we go. Right, and then to prove that every polynomial is Lipschitz on a bounded domain, well, note that uh, x to the k, where k runs from 0 to n, is guaranteed to be Lipschitz by 0.1 and 0.6. Scaling any Lipschitz functions is Lipschitz, and then adding up Lipschitz functions remains Lipschitz, and so there we go. Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. All right. So, there we go. We have now demonstrated a nice collection of functions uh, that have the Lipschitz property. We've discussed that Lipschitz functions uh, behave nicely with scaling, adding, and multiplication. Good stuff. All right, so let's wrap this whole piece up with a final proposition. So, as promised, there are functions that fail to be Lipschitz, and one of them is square root of x. And, right, that shouldn't be too shocking because... Note what Lipschitz is measuring is it's measuring the slopes of the secant lines. And square root of x we know at zero is not very happy with secant lines. Right? Because x equals zero, square root of x is not differentiable because the tangent lines go vertical, which means the secant lines go vertical. Mm. So, ah, uh, yes. However, though, it does remain uniformly continuous. Now, um, this will be the last thing we prove, and uh, this is a proposition, like many propositions, like all the propositions in analysis. This is very near and dear to my heart. This one especially is super near and dear to my heart, um, because when I learned about uniform continuity in my analysis class, just like you are right now, um, the professor pointed out that uh, Lipschitz functions are always uniformly continuous, but the converse is not true. And then he wrote this function on the board, 
And he said, this is obviously not Lipschitz. And he did not elaborate any further. He just said, this is obviously not Lipschitz. And um, for your homework, you're going to prove that it's uniformly continuous. Okay. Um, so when I took analysis, uh, the way the professor did that class was every uh, class, he assigned one problem um, for homework. And so this was the one he assigned. Um, and so we went to office hours, and office hours, uh, it was, uh, if I remember right, there was three of us? Maybe there was two. I don't remember, for sure. Uh, but I think there was three of us in the room. Okay, so there was me, and, uh, uh, somebody else that was in the room was, uh, somebody named Scott Lalonde. Scott Lalonde is currently a professor at the University at Texas, uh, uh University of Texas at Tyler. Um, he... Got his PhD from Dartmouth in functional analysis, uh, so check out some of his cool stuff. But so we went there trying to figure out how to prove this function is uniformly continuous. Uh, good old Professor Dempsey. We came in, we had like no idea what to do because he gave us like no context. He gave us nothing. He was like, "Prove it's uniform. It's obvious." Um, and then so we asked him what to do, and so. Um, uh, Professor Dempsey, um, took out his, uh, his stack of engineering paper, he started writing stuff on it, and then he stopped, and then he paused, and then he was dead silent for, like, 20 minutes. So, we're sitting in office hours, and he's not saying anything, and he is just sitting there staring and uh <laughs> Professor Dempsey was, was, was oh boy was he was was he a character uh but um very very not intimidating guy but definitely like a I don't know <laughs> uh intense fellow uh so anyway he's just dead silent we're just sitting there like waiting for something to happen so it's 20 minutes of dead silence and then, out of nowhere, slams his pen on the paper and goes, "Damn it!" <laughs> and <laughs> we look at each other and we're like, "What?" <laughs> and and, then, and if I remember right, all he said was like, "I need to think about it more." <laughs> like that was, and we're like, "Holy shit!" This problem's, oh my god. Um, so I don't even remember, uh, I, I don't even think I, I even did that homework. I think I was like, okay, I'm, yo, I'm passing on this one. I'm not even gonna. Um, now, it's not very hard, but there is a moment where it seems like you, you, you get hosed. And I don't know for sure what went on in Professor Dempsey's brain that day, um, even though I was in the room. Um, uh, I, I think I know where he got hung up, uh, because there's a spot, there was a spot where you gotta be clever, and he thought, he thought he could do it on the fly, and yeah, yeah, okay, so let's get to it, alright, so the trick here is, um, to break the domain up into two pieces, okay, so, first things first, uh, the function find on 0, 1 by g of x is equal to the square root of x, must be uniformly continuous. 0, 1 is closed and bounded, and square rooting is a continuous function. Square roots do not ruin limits, um, so this must be uniformly continuous. Okay, so from 0 to 1, we're going to get a delta. From 1 to infinity, as we're going to see, from 1 to infinity, square root of x is actually Lipschitz. So, from 1 to infinity, it's uniformly continuous. So, there are two domains that we can split it up and get the function is uniformly continuous. And it turns out that as long as your domains overlap, you can guarantee uniform continuity on the union. But, you gotta be a little clever. Okay. So, let's do it. Okay, so given an epsilon... Then uh, we can find, we're not going to use a delta right now, we can find an eta so that for all x and y that live in 0, 1, um, 
so that x minus y is less than eta, then uh, the outputs can be guaranteed less than epsilon over 2. No, epsilon over 2. This is the tricky thing. This is this is what I'm 99% sure Professor Dempsey was overlooking and what, what got him uh, in trouble. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to set delta equal to the minimum of eta and epsilon. Or whichever one is smaller. Note, dependent solely upon my epsilon, right? The eta is dependent solely on the epsilon. The delta is also dependent solely on the epsilon. Let x and y in 0 to infinity be within delta of each other. There are three possibilities. There are three cases to now consider. And I kind of already spoiled uh, what you need to do. So first off, if x and y are both less than 1, that means they are in this domain. And since they are less than delta away from each other, they are within eta of each other. And so our hypothesis guarantees that f of x minus f of y is less than epsilon. That should be a strict there. I don't know why I don't have that strict. Okay. So right now, it's not quite clear why I have the epsilon over 2. But trust me. Trust me. Okay. So for all x and y that live uh, less than 1, we're good. Okay. Now, for all x and y that are bigger than 1... As I've already uh, let slip, square root of x is actually ellipsis on this domain. Uh, because if you look at f of x minus f of y, all right, well, then you've got root x minus root y. And hey, hey, root x plus root y is definitely not equal to zero because it's greater than or equal to two. So multiply by one, dirtiest trick in the book. This times this will give me absolute value of x minus y. We'll pick that up in the denominator. This is always greater than 2, so 1 over 2 is always less than 1 half. All right, and x minus y is less than uh, delta, which is less than or equal to epsilon. So we got epsilon over 2, and thus we get epsilon. Okay. All right, so if my x and y are both less than 1, we're good. And if my x and y are both bigger than 1, we're good. And here is where I'm 99% sure Professor Dempsey got stuck. What happens if one is on the left and one is on the right? What do you do then? And here's where you got to be creative. If x is less than 1 and y is less than 1, the difference, the distance between x and y is less than delta. So that means x minus 1 which, note, is equal to 1 minus x, its absolute value is, 1 is less than y, y minus x is less than delta, which is less than eta. 1 minus y, which has to equal y minus 1, the absolute value of it. Note, x is less than 1, so negative 1 is less than negative x. That's less than delta, which must be less than equal to epsilon. X and 1 are both less than 1. Y and 1 are both bigger than 1. So by the arguments that I just made, because X and 1 are less than 1, we know that root X minus 1 is less than epsilon over 2. Right, because the distance between X and 1 is less than eta. 1 minus root y must be less than epsilon over 2 as well, since 1 and y are bigger than 1, and the distance between, difference between them is less than epsilon, as we just noted on uh, the interval 1 to infinity, root of x is Lipschitz, with constant uh, 1 over 2. So now f of x minus f of y, which is root x minus root y, by the triangle equality is less than this, and now the epsilons over 2s show up, and we get less than epsilon. There we go. We have got uniform continuity. Beautiful. There you go. Super slick little argument right there, right? Really good proof. I love this one. It's so cool. This is so cool. Um, I forgot when I decided to go back and actually, like, figure out how do you prove that root is uh, uniformly continuous? Um, it, no, it, it requires, uh, right, it requires you to recognize that you can split the domain into two pieces, and on the two pieces you have the uniform continuity, and then at the overlap, 
you can make things work. Okay. So note if right, it doesn't matter which one is to the left of one and which one's to the right of one. This case is handled similarly. So really slick. Really cool proof. Right. So and no, kind of a, a very non-trivial step here at the very end. Um, and also, like, broadly, you, you need to know going in that you have to cut the domain into two pieces. And, um... Yeah, it, it's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's neat. Really cool. Alright, so there we go. Square root of x is uniformly continuous. That's quite nice. And notice, uniformly continuous on its entire domain. So, where x squared, um betrayed us on its entire domain. Square root of x did not. That's really interesting to think about. Right, because square rooting undoes x squared. But x squared is not uniformly continuous, but square root of x is. Very neat. Okay. All right. So, we are almost done for today, so we've demonstrated that F is uniformly continuous. The only thing we need to do now is actually verify that it's not Lipschitz, so we have an example of uniform continuity, but not necessarily having Lipschitz. Okay, so suppose that it was indeed Lipschitz, then there is an L, so that this inequality holds, that's good for all X and Y. <coughs> okay. Uh, that, as I uh, noted... Um, right, we, going into this, we can kind of expect this to fall apart, because square root of x uh, fails to be differentiable at zero, the tangent lines get arbitrarily large, and Lipschitz is basically saying that not necessarily anything about the tangent lines, it's telling us that the secant lines have to behave. Okay. Well, uh, we can find a capital N that is bigger than L. All right, however, 1 over n is definitely equal to this. Uh, by the assumption that f is Lipschitz, this must hold. All right, but now you just cross multiply n squared, and we get our favorite contradiction, n is strictly less than n. All right, and with that, we have completed continuity. Well, for now, anyway. Continuity, of course, will still play a role uh, as we go on through the remainder of the semester. Uh, but for the time being, we have hit all the greatest hits about continuity. So, what's the goal now? Well, it's very derivative what we're about to do next. So, see you next time.